嗨，大家好，我是胡阿伯。今天我要用三十分钟来教完你 UCCN 一二一三的 Lab Three。So, not all interiors are created equal. Some are just better than the other. And one of the thing about good interiors is they are able to detect nested virus. So what do we mean by nested virus? Take a look at this example. So let's say an antivirus is able to detect this as a virus because it recognizes the pattern of this bird. And if I enter this virus into a container like this, and now this is what the antivirus sees. It is no longer the bird that they used to recognize. So in some cases, the antivirus might not be able to detect that there is a virus that is currently being contained inside this container. So although we can say that hacker really smart by hiding a payload into a container like this, some of the antivirus are even smarter because they know the trick. So for some good antivirus, while they are doing the scan, they would actually unzip like this to recover the payload in a zip file before they scan this payload with the virus signature file. So, the hacker know about this. Some interiors would unpack the zip file before scanning for the virus signature. So what do they do? They take the zip file containing the virus where they are expecting the interiors to unpack and put it into another zip file like this. And now, this becomes even more difficult to be detected because the interiors will have to unpack, unpack once to get this one unpacked twice before it can finally scan that there is a virus contained in this zip file. Now, to download the three virus files, it is important that you should disable the antivirus that is currently running on the machines. And to do so, you have to look out for virus and threat protections under the second line. So in the section virus and threat protection settings, Click on Manage Settings and over here just turn everything off for now. Of course, don't forget to turn this back on after you are done with the example. Another thing that you will need to turn off will be the firewall. So on the search bar, type firewall. When you see this chat firewall status, press enter and you should see the current firewall setting which should be running, shown in green. So what you want to do now is to turn all of them off so that when you download this first file, your machine will not delete it straight away. So over here, we have a similar example. I have a virus file named ICAR.com and I take this virus file and zip it into ICAR.zip and taking the zip file that contains the original virus, I further zip it again into ICAR2.zip. So our intuition here is that a good antivirus should be able to detect iCloud.com as a virus and an even better antivirus should be able to detect even iCloud.zip where now the virus has been contained inside a zip file as a payload and the best antivirus should be able to detect iCloud2.zip where a zip file that is containing a virus is further zipped once again. So this is how we are going to do it. Navigate to virus total. Browse to this website and this virus total will be the scanner that we're using for this example. So what, what is virus total? Virus total to me is the mother of all antivirus because it is actually a collection of antiviruses. So instead of trying one antivirus at a time, one by one, to see whether it is able to detect the viruses, we use virus total. To do so, you simply take the virus file that we are trying to scan and drag it like this. So in a while, you can see that these are the scan results. It is already out. As you can see here, it is actually a collection of all popular antiviruses and all the results, the scan results from all these antiviruses. 
So, the first reason we want to use virus loader is we do not have to try each of the antivirus individually to see whether they are able to detect icar.com. So now, taking a look at the result, you're going to get two kind of results, either in red or in green. Now, when you see it is in green, it means it is undetected. Now, taking CMC as the example, this means that this antivirus doesn't detect icar.com as a virus, which means that this virus goes undetected. So that's not a good thing. On another end, if you get a red result, it means that this antivirus is able to tell that this is actually a virus, which is a good sign. Now, why do you have the line that says this is not a virus? Okay, this is here because most popular antivirus these days know iCar.com is not a real virus. iCar.com is just some, it's like a fake virus where we created for testing purposes and education purposes. So most of the AV right now is able to know that although it has the definition of a virus, the signature looks like a virus, but it is not a real virus that can actually harm the machine. So to finish this exercise, you simply have to repeat the scan with the other two files. So we have done with icar.com. The next one you would like to try would be icar.zip. So drag and drop, and in a while you will see all the scan result is already up. So over here, you are starting to see there are more uh, antivirus that is not able to detect this icar.com within a zip as a virus file. So there are more undetected going on here. And finally, we repeat the same thing with the last file here, which is icar2.zip. So this is the boss file. And let's drag this into the virus total. Now we take a look at the result here. You should see most of the popular AV is still able to tell that this is a zip within a zip that contains a virus. But now you can see there is actually even more antivirus that is not able to tell apart that this zip within a zip actually contain a virus file. So you have more green color here, which is actually not a good sign. Now I think it's a bit counterintuitive, like normally when we see green, it is a good sign, but over here, it is the other way around. So if you see a red, it is a good sign because that means your antivirus is able to detect that there is a virus coming in to your machine. So to answer the first question, first I'll make a table with 5 rows and 4 columns. So the first column would be for the choice of antivirus that you are comparing for this example. So you're free to choose any 5 antivirus, which means that you can randomly pick any 5 of them from this screen. So for example, let's say if you go with AdAware, Alibaba, the first 5, Akabit, Awas, and Avira. So you want to Right, then the name of the antivirus now. So, now the next column here, you just have to put in whether this particular antivirus of your choice is able to detect this icar.com as a virus or it goes undetected. So, if it is able to detect, just put a tick to represent yes and X to represent no. So for the first column, it is for icar.com. So we simply repeat what we have done earlier. Drag the icar.com into virus loader, and once you got the result, you can simply uh, copy it in. So for our case, all of our antivirus of choice is actually able to detect that this icar.com is a virus. Although they actually know that this is a fake virus for testing and education purpose, so you put tick for all of them, which means they are able to detect. Then we repeat the exercise by scanning icar.z and again we can see all of them is able to detect. So we we'll go back to the answer sheet and we put all as able to detect. And the last one would be icar2.z. 
drag and draw, and yeah, you get all the answers here. And again, they are able to detect that this is actually a test virus. So based on my choice of antivirus here, this is the answer that I'm going to get. So, we are in to your boyfriend machine and the keylogger has already been installed here. So, the, so this is the keylogger that we are going to use for this example. And when you first started, it will look something like this. So, of course, for you to start to capture the keystroke every time a person type on the keyboard, click on Start Monitoring. Now of course, don't forget to hide this thing, otherwise your boyfriend will definitely know that you are spying on me. The boyfriend will say, hey, don't you trust me? And that's not what you want. Now for the sake of the demonstration, I will not be hiding this keylogger. Now let's imagine that this notepad file is actually your Facebook Messenger and your boy has been chatting on the Messenger. So for example, he said, happy tonight, I'll pick you up. Okay. This is just an example, it is not based on any true story. When your boy is done with all the chatting and when he leaves his PC unattended, that's where you can go back and unhide the keylogger and you can actually see all the logs of all the characters that he has typed in into the machine earlier. So in our case, you can actually see that Keylogger even captured all the shift, control, all the net buttons. And of course, he's as his own words, happy tonight, I'll pick you up. And that is how you catch a cheating boyfriend. Okay, now for the boy part. Now boys, now of course, you might already notice that keylogger is running on the machine but if you just close the keylogger then and your girl might be thinking hey do you re really have something to hide that's not what we want so instead we're going to get let this keylogger run on the background and continue to chat on our messenger to our favorite people without letting this keylogger to capture any keystrokes that we type in So method number one, we can simply type out all the alphabets A from A to Z. And then instead of typing our message, now we will just copy and paste the characters for our message one character at a time. So with the character list here, what I'll do next is I'll just copy the character to form the sentence that I'm trying to write. So for example, say if I want to write I love you, I'll just copy I followed by L O V E until I finally form the full sentence. So if you go back to Keylogger and try to look at the log that we have, in fact you'll get quite a number of logs, but none of them will actually reveal the characters that we have just copy and paste. Instead, what you actually see are just all the keystrokes of Ctrl C, Ctrl V, Ctrl C, and Ctrl V, which is not going to reveal our messages. Now, method number two. So let's say I want to write, I love you, the same message, click on start monitoring, and instead of typing my message up exactly, as I want it to be, I'll just type it randomly uh, in a random order with a lot of random characters like this. So of course all these characters would already been captured by the keylogger. That's fine. 
because that is not our messages. So what I do now is I'll erase all the characters that is not supposed to be part of the original message. And that what is the leftover are uh, the original message. I love you. And now let's find out whether does the keylogger capture our actions. So when you go back to the keylogger, there is in fact only one log file. And in this case, although you have all the sequence on backspace, things like that, you wouldn't be able to figure out exactly what are the characters that I have deleted because it doesn't capture our mouse cursor selections and the cursor positions. This is how I say I love you in a million ways that I know of. Bibi, you super super I will love. So over here, this is the virtualization architecture. So if you are familiar with VMware or VirtualBox, stuff like that, then in fact, each VM that is built and run on the virtual box is considered as a sandbox. This diagram shows that you actually have three boxes that are running. So you have one on the left, one on the middle, and one on the right. As you can see, each of the box has their own OS, and we call this as a guest OS, meaning that for each of these boxes, you could be running Windows 10 on one, Linux on the other one, and a Mac OS on the third one. And then you have all the apps for every box, depending on what you're trying to do with the box. So let's say the box on the right got hacked. Now what the hacker does is he get into this box through some open ports that are vulnerable and then try to delete the whole user directory. So which means that this box is now compromised and affected to a, to a stage where it is no longer usable and working. So all the damage that happened here we are not affect the box on the middle and on the left because what happened in the box stays within the box itself. Okay, now I'm going to demonstrate the concept of sandboxing by showing you that when I create a file on a sandbox, the new file that I created will not appear on the real operating system. For that, I'm going to use this sandbox here and once you run Sandbox C, look at the bottom right corner, right click on the Sandbox C icon, go to default box and you want to choose run window explorer. So over here, if you notice, this box here is enclosed by a yellow frame. So all the windows that has a yellow frame on them, are actually running as sandbox C, so, so they are virtual. Now, if I go to the desktop, you will be seeing two desktop, which are actually mirror image of each other. So this is a one-to-one -one copy. As you can see, I have a keylogger, sandbox, and a lab tree icon here. And I also have the same tree icon on the virtual sandbox. Now, in the sandbox, whatever happened inside the sandbox stays within the sandbox. So for example, let's say if I create a file and I'm going to create a new text file here named virus.txt and I create this file, you can tell that this file doesn't show up on the real desktop because whatever that I create on this sandbox C will stays within the memory of located for this sandbox. Now, for the other way around, if I create a word, a text document here on the real window, says assignment.txt, this time you can actually see that the assignment file will appear on the sandbox. So to sum this up, whatever that you create or run on the sandbox will not be reflected on the real OS, while whatever you do on the real OS will be reflected inside the sandbox. 
So over here, I have this lab tree file, which is sent from my that friend that I told you earlier, which I have trust issue with. And now this one could be a virus or it could be just a normal file. And what I'm going to do next is I want to run this file to find out whether it is really a virus or not. And to do so, I will not click on here because what if it is a real virus, right? So instead, I will be running this lab tree file inside the sandbox itself. And finally, we found out that this is not malicious. So yeah, maybe I overthink a little bit. This is actually not a harmful program. But who can you blame, right? Okay, friend, look what you make me do. So the whole point of this example is to show you that if lab tree happened to be a virus, a real harmful virus, this, the damage of the virus will only affect this sandbox it will contain within this sandbox, whereas the real OS outside is still going to work as usual. Okay, now let's talk about VNC. VNC is the remote login software where you can use to connect from a client to a server, which could be far, far away from you right now, so that you can log in to do, perform some remote tasks, and you don't really have to be physically there to do so. Now, of course, we have learned about many kinds of remote login. We started with Telnet and SSH, and there are, both of them are actually command based, which means that although you can get in to a server, you still need to know what are the commands that you should be typing to do certain things on the server. Now, in this example, we're going to show you VNC, where it is actually a UI based remote login. Okay, now, we're going to show you how VNC works. So, of course, for every remote login, you need to have a client and a server. So, the server will be the machines that you are trying to connect into to perform some remote tasks. So, on the client side, which in this case will be your local machines, you need to have VNC Viewer. And if you have already installed that, you can simply search for VNC Viewer. Now, on the other end, make sure your Windows XP virtual box is running because this would be the VNC server. Look at the bottom right corner, you can actually see that your VNC server is currently running and that in a short while, we're going to connect into this Windows, uh, Windows XP machines through this VNC service. Now, before you can do that, you have to set up the user password. Right click on the VNC icon, go to options, under user and permissions, Click on password and this is where you put in your password. Of course, I wouldn't say it here, otherwise it wouldn't be a password anymore. So I'll just put in a random password. Click OK and click OK. Now, the password has been set. The next thing we want to do is try to connect to this server using the VNC client. So, for you to do so, you will need two things. First, of course, the password that you have just set and second the IP address of the server. To find out the IP, go to run, run cmd, which will open up your command prompt and type ipconfig to find out what is your current IP address. So in my case it is 192.168.119.8. So I simply type this IP into the VNC viewer and click connect. So when you see this message, click continue. This is a good sign which means that we have already found the server. So the next thing is to put in our password that we have just set up earlier and yeah, here we go. So this means that we are already inside the Windows XP machines. So on the left, you can see this is the original Windows XP, which means that if I want to work on these machines, on the left hand side, I have to get there physically. But if I just want so let's say if I'm on the right side, I'm far, far away from the left hand side machines and I still want to do something on it, I can use VNC to get into the machines and I can do exactly what I could do just as I'm physically there in front of the machines. So just to demonstrate, in fact, if I run a command prompt here, you can see that the real machine actually opened up a command prompt. So the next thing. How do I kick this user out? Let's say the right hand side is your boyfriend, the left hand side is you. 
so your boyfriend connect into your heart but he forget your anniversary so now i'm going to kick this guy out he forget my anniversary how can i forgive him for something like that how do you kick him out it is as simple as turning on your firewall so on middle xp go to control panel go to inner firewall if you turn this on click ok then you are no longer be able to connect so I do the same without changing any setting of the server i click connect and this time you will see the connecting keeps spinning 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 until you give up first or you see a timeout message now there's another trick here say i turn on the firewall but you still want to allow someone to do a remote login through vnc you can actually go to exceptions and then you allow vnc to get through while blocking some other network services that's it for all the labs today thank you for listening if you like this video help me to smack the like button if you don't like this video share it to someone you don't like of course this is going to go on forever and ever like when hacker put a virus into a container and now the hackers know how to unpack so the hacker now put it into another container and now the antivirus know that it has to unpack twice so the hacker put it into the container and now the antivirus know that it has to unpack three times and then it's going to go on forever and forever until and if I continue in this way then this video is going to be 10 hours long now in some rare cases where you encounter any issues with the connections you might want to try to change the power so for example let's say you try to connect and you are sure that the ip is already correct go to options <clears throat> under connections here you should change this default 5900 to some other numbers so let's say i change this to one two three four five okay so press okay and you do the same thing on the vnc viewer type in the ip address and this time you want to add a double colon followed by the port number because we are not local using the default port so this time we have to specify the new port number click connect and you should be able to get it the same way we did earlier so this is only for those who are having issues connecting to the server although all the IP settings is already correct and the main reason is because it could be that the port number 5900 that is supposed to be used by the VNC server has been used up by some other programs running in the background.